Thank you, Jaydeep. Uh, J.D. Bansal is an environmental and social impact leader from India, and he is the COO at the Global Himalayan Expedition, an award-winning social enterprise that is working to bring sustainable development to the remotest communities of India. Uh, the Global Himalayan Expedition is the winner of the 2020 UN Climate Action Award and the UNWTO has recognized it as one of the successful case studies in sustainable tourism. Uh, Jaydeep has been uh, featured repeatedly at Davos among the top leaders inspiring change in the world and uh, is also an ASIA Foundation Fellow. He has served as uh, the Foundation Board Member of the Global Shapers Community an initiative of the World Economic Forum. We are really honored to have him on stage of Youth for Mountain Zero. So uh, thank you, Jaydeep, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, am I audible? Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are connecting from in different parts of the world. And uh, it's a real honor and privilege to be sharing the work uh, that we are doing in the Indian Himalayas with all of you. And hopefully uh, in the next 15 minutes, uh, through the story that I shared with all of you, uh, provide all of you with some inspiration that uh, even though the mountains have a lot to offer, there is a lot that we need to give back to the mountains as well and to the mountain communities that live in the harshest of the environments. I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay, great. So to just give you a context, uh, globally, there are more than a billion people in the world that are still living in darkness. And most of these places live in, uh, people live in such beautiful places. Now, when you look at this picture, the first thought that comes to your mind is just, wow, just look at the view, clean air, fresh water, uh, you know, beautiful organic farming fields. But what happens when the sun goes down, where the people have to use kerosene lamps for the lighting needs? Now imagine it's minus 20 degree outside. You cannot go outside because it's too cold. You cannot open the windows and you have to resort to burning kerosene in these closed spaces, which causes a lot of smoke and pollution. I have been in these environments and your eyes start watering, you start coughing, you can't breathe properly. Now, what is a one-time experience for me is something that's part of routine for these communities. Now, what happens when for these remote communities that live in the Himalayas, due to the lack of basic facilities and due to the lack of livelihood and education, the people end up migrating to the towns. And when they migrate to the towns, they leave behind a culture and heritage that is centuries old. I mean, ask yourself, if you were a young person living in a remote region, would you like to stay in a place which has no facilities or would you like to stay in a place which has facilities to provide you and your younger generation with aspirations that they can pursue? The natural answer is you would want to migrate towards facilities or towards access. But what if we could reverse this cycle? What if we could bring access to development to these remote communities and enable a way for them to earn livelihood while they are staying in their pristine environments and preserving the natural habitat of the Himalayas. And that's where GHE or Global Himalayan Expedition comes into picture. Our mission is to leverage technology and tourism to bring development to these remotest communities of the world. GHE has been leveraging tourism and technology as a force for holistic development to create self-sustainable, smart and carbon neutral villages. It starts with access to clean energy, creating skill development and entrepreneurship for these communities, and ultimately impacting eight of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Because if you really want to achieve the SDG goals by 2030, they won't be achieved in a Italy or a New Delhi or uh, some of the bigger places. They, the last mile also has to be included in the growth journey. Because if the last mile is not included, we will never be able to achieve the SDG goals. Our geographic focus is in the north part of India in this map that you can see towards the Himalayas and the northeast part of India towards the jungle areas of India, which is the lower Himalayas as they call it. So all the way from upper Himalayas to the lower Himalayas of India. And 
our impact ranges from bringing electricity through solar energy to these villages creating digital education content for the students bringing access to health good quality health care through solar power working on carbon neutrality projects everyone is talking about carbon neutrality and becoming net zero and we are finding ways where companies can able to offset their emissions but also create impact for the communities but none of these interventions is possible unless and until there is livelihood and income generation which is achieved through homestay tourism so think of it airbnb in the himalayas that's what we are working on and i'll come to a bit by bit in terms of what we are doing in each of these interventions but what does it take to reach these villages well first you have to go on roads dirt roads where you can drive anywhere i mean there's no road here that you can see it's just a path uh, and you can drive anywhere along this road for days and days when the road ends you have to trek you have to walk for 2 to 3 days or 4 days sometimes to reach these villages and the trek paths can be really bad sometimes but when you finally reach the village you are greeted with a culture and heritage that is centuries old this is how the warm welcome that you get when you receive reach the village what happens when we reach the village then we start setting up the solar panels and the lights so the solar panels go on the roofs of the houses and you can see the beautiful background of the solar panel covered in snow and then you fix the light bulb holders and put the led lights in the houses of these villagers and in just two days in just two to three days a village that has never seen electricity is transformed from darkness to light that is the power of technology and that is the power of human will and the communities that if you really want to bring about a change change is possible and you can see this transformation happening and ultimately it's about providing these elderly men and women in these villages with a hope that they don't have to live in darkness anymore this is the same woman that you saw in the first picture using kerosene lamps who is now transitioned to led lights and you know uh, she she ended up crying when she said this she said i thought in my lifetime i'll never see electricity but uh, you know that's that's a kind of happiness and joy that you see on the lives uh, on the faces of these people and it's truly transforming communities from the pre industrial revolution technology to the fourth industrial revolution i mean if you look at these surroundings where you are sitting you might be getting a electricity from a big grid infrastructure there might be big grid lines that are providing you electricity but these communities they are producing and consuming their own energy at a local level which is renewable totally clean and they are not dependent on a big grid infrastructure and that is really the future of electricity and it's truly about transitioning these communities from kerosene lamps to led lights in each and every room what happens when the people get electricity when they see electricity for the first time let me ask you all when was the last time you entered a room that was dark you switched on the light and you started dancing you never do that right but that's the kind of reaction you get with these people you know they start dancing they start crying and you know there's so much uh, joy and happiness i mean we've seen that some of the celebrations that i have been a part of we ended up celebrating throughout the night just because now the village has electricity so that's the impact that we have had till now more than 150 villages done in the himalayan region to impact the lives of 100000 people and offset more than 35000 tons of carbon emissions in the process and who are the people who are electrifying these villages so we do take volunteers with us so these are a group of students from high schools and universities that come along with us on our mission to bring energy access to these villages and these group of students electrified this village in just two days and so it's really about showcasing to the young people that change is possible even in the remotest of the worlds that if you have the right resources the right skill set and the right technology change is very much possible and like i said you know all of this is not possible unless and until you empower the local community once the uh, grids are installed who's going to maintain it who's going to own it and that's where community empowerment comes into picture it's about identifying young men and women from these very villages and training them as solar engineers and creating that capacity development so that anything after once the villages are electrified if anything goes bad we have a pool of engineers who's going to help repair and maintain once these villages have access to electricity the next step is to provide their kids with access to digital content mind you there's no mobile connectivity in these villages there's no internet 
in fact some of the students have never seen a computer and so what we do is we go to these villages set up digital innovation centers and it's fascinating to see when a child explores a computer for the first time it looks a bit alien but after 5 minutes they've figured out everything how to open wikipedia how to open khan academy how to open some ted talks and that's the kind of information that we load onto a server which is which creates a offline internet so you're able to create a offline internet uh and with all the preloaded content and then kids can access and you know what do kids do when they get access to content or they get access to education well you can see this picture which i really love on the right hand side bottom where the girl is opening up a video by the nasa jpl on the mars rover so it's it's really about exciting and initiating that igniting the minds of these kids to what are the possibilities that exist and ultimately you know for us at ghe who are we question who are these mountains to decide which child should have access and which child should not have access why can't these students be at par with the rest of you who have access to all the basic facilities so what is preventing these kids from having it beyond education the covid times also presented us with a pretty uh, grave situation that in these remote areas the healthcare facilities are very poor there is no way for uh, vaccines to be administered because there are no cold storage facilities and so what we did was in these remote areas we started setting up solar powered health centers and so each health center the government uh, setups were powered up using solar energy but more than that we also installed critical medical care equipment for restoring the faith in modern medicine of the local communities who had stopped coming to these health center because every time they used to come the light was not there the right equipment was not there in fact you know women had to uh, do deliveries uh, of babies under candlelight so that's the kind of poor facilities that were there in these remote areas so it was really about upgrading these health centers and providing all the modern facilities so that people restore their confidence in modern medicine and this is a example of a solar powered health center in the remote himalayas in the region of changthang where uh, the average altitude is more than 4000 meters and so there they with the solar health center they were also able to administer covid vaccines because of the cold storage that we have set up now in these remote areas as we look at communities and as we look at the overall broad development spectrum we see what are the possible problems that the community is facing and how can they be solved by creating win win scenarios now you've all seen everyone is taking a climate pledge everyone wants to become carbon neutral every big organization in the world wants to become carbon neutral but they cannot do it in silos they have to achieve collaboration and partnerships and that's where we come in these communities use a uh, traditional firewood for cooking food which produces a lot of fumes and these fumes are uh, create a lot of health and respiratory issues with a simple solution of introducing cleaner cook stoves we are able to reduce the emissions by almost 80 to 90% and create a 60% reduction in carbon emissions what that means is that if i am able to reach out to 100 100000 households i'll be able to offset more than 1.5 million tons of carbon emissions now 1.5 million tons is a huge number but for any big organization that's able to offset their entire supply chains and they are able to do that while providing these communities with ways to cook their food in a cleaner and efficient manner so it creates a win win scenario and also the net output is that these communities are able to preserve and conserve their forest reserves which they are chopping up unnecessarily for their own daily food now all of this is great but unless and until there is no livelihood intervention or there is no ways for the community to earn income then all, all of these things are not sustainable and that's where the concept of homestays comes into picture so our idea is to set up homestays and link them to the sdg goals to bring development to these communities and essentially create carbon neutral homestays so all the homestays that we set up in these villages so think of it we electrify a village then we identify villages that are very beautiful and scenic and then we set up and invest in setting up homestay infrastructure and once once that is done then we promote them online through airbnb booking.com and other platforms what that does is enables travelers to visit these beautiful places and also experience some some kind of uh, 
you know, travel experiences that they have never done before, such as astrotourism. All it took was us, for us, was to install a telescope, a 10-inch Dobsonian telescope in the villages. And now, because the Himalayas have clear night skies, people can get access to astrotourism. And that creates income generation for the communities. For us, it's ultimately about creating smart and sustainable carbon neutral villages and ensure that there are enough opportunities for the young men and women in the villages to continue to stay in the villages, the elderly people in the villages to have faith that even if they are staying in the village, they will have access to all the facilities and the villages. For our efforts, we've been awarded the United Nations Global Climate Action Award in 2020. And along with that, we've also had multiple documentaries. So if you guys are interested, we also have a documentary by National Geographic uh, as part of its breakthrough series, Power to the People. And then the BBC also has a documentary on our work. Uh, and I'm happy to share those links with you uh, post this uh, session. So ultimately, there's one thing that I want to leave you all with is when you guys look at your own personal journeys, you know, some of you might be inspired to create impact, but when you look at creating impact, start small, start from your own self, because change has to happen from within. Once you start from your own self, then you so think of it, this as spiraling out in terms of the kind of influence you can have. Once you are able to change yourself, once you're able to commit to being climate positive and carbon neutral yourself, then influence your friends and family, then look at your look local communities, then look at your regional communities, and then think of how you can create a national and international impact. Because it is all of us who need to come together. Do the math. If one billion of us are able to, if even one of us is able to influence seven lives directly, that means we'll be able to reach out to seven billion people. And that's the whole world's population. So I'll end with this note and happy to take any question and answers. Thank you so much. It was very interesting to see uh, all these, uh, let's say, uh, solutions that doesn't require huge infrastructures. And uh, I think this is very interesting because we don't have all the, uh, let's say, the need for uh, infrastructure works that are sometimes very polluting, very expensive, uh, and uh, many times they're not uh, so efficient. So it's very interesting to see that you can actually provide people with technology, uh, lights, uh, cooking facilities and so on without all this infrastructure. And this is great to see. And I think this is also useful from a perspective of, um, uh, let's say, for example, Alpine countries, which are more developed. So we don't really have that need of uh, basic needs that need to fulfill basic needs. But it's interesting to see how this kind of technology could be applied, for example, to mountain huts or very remote uh, um, agricultural villages and so on. So this is something that is valuable also from our perspective. And of course, it's great to see that uh, what you're doing, it's uh, helping out people to develop further their villages, remaining green and sustainable. That's great. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering if there are any questions in the chat or anyone uh, who wants to come in and uh, just uh, ask a question to Jaydeep. Feel free to switch on your uh, camera and microphone and uh, make your question. Giacomo, <laughs> I'd like to uh, congratulate with uh, JID. I'm Anna Giorgi, I'm the responsible of uh, Mountain University and uh, I appreciated very much uh, the messages uh, you shared with us. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, that we have to start from ourselves in adopting uh, the right habits in order to promote sustainability. And this principle is uh, valuable uh, there in Himalaya uh, villages, but also here in the Alps. So uh, thank you, really thank you very much and keep in touch. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I think just to add here uh, that, uh, you know, since all of you come from the Alpian region, uh, the Alps have been uh, facing the brunt of climate change as well with, with over tourism, uh, especially because everyone wants to go skiing and uh, you end up uh, having a lot of resorts uh, that uh, emit a lot of carbon emissions. So I think 
And if you look at the statistics per capita, per person, the amount of carbon emissions in Europe is around 30 to 35 tons, whereas in India, it's 2.5 tons. But uh, essentially, what we are trying to showcase here is that even if the remotest of the communities can aspire to become carbon neutral, why can't places like Europe become carbon neutral? What does it take to accelerate the needle and push the agenda for carbon neutrality at a faster pace? Why, why 2030? Why not 2022? What does it take for our, all of us to do that? And I think unless and until all of us do not demand those things, uh, unless and until all of us do not make those choices consciously, things are never going to change. If you go to a resort and if you ask for heating, which is causing carbon emissions, you're going to get it, right? But if you ask for heating, where you say that I want a heated room, but I do not want it to pollute my environment. If all of us start asking that, then the resort owners have to then start changing the way they are investing in technology. And that's if that comes at a higher price, it will be. But that's the kind of choices that we need to start making. On this, JD, uh, I live in a small village where our detachment uh, university is. So it's up in the in the Central Alps, and I've been visiting a, a house here which was heated with um, with uh, methane in uh, 2021 in Italy, which is uh, still a rich country, you know, uh, globally speaking, and it's uh, heated with methane. So. You can see that uh, we still have a lot to do yeah. even here. Yeah. And this is a problem for uh, old houses in uh, mountain areas. So I True. think what you're saying about technology and their application, it's, it applies everywhere, everywhere, definitely. Yeah. If anyone wants to come in and uh, ask a question to JD, we, we can still have uh, a few minutes for that if you want. Uh, hi, Jadeep. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so recently I've been doing a lot of research um, and attending a lot of talks around um, glaciers and glacier preservation. And one of the main topics that kept coming up was um, actually that of human waste and the effect of people leaving behind waste on expeditions and um, villages not understanding that hygiene and then the effect that has off has in water runoff um, and agricultural production further down the mountain um, because it's coming from above. Are you guys doing anything in relation to that in terms of education um, and spreading the message of, about how important it is to pack in and pack out and um, have better hygiene? So what we have done locally is uh, that uh, we have started, uh, we have coordinated with the local government on a project which is known as Sangha, which means zero waste in the local language. So all the waste is collected, it is segregated at a village level, and then it is sent to uh, recycling centers that are scattered across the region, where the entire waste is recycled or upcycled, and whatever cannot be recycled is then incinerated. So uh it it is not a very efficient way right now but there is a start at uh, the local level uh further uh, what we've seen is inherently these communities lead a very sustainable life but as soon as tourism comes in that sustainability goes for a toss because suddenly you're consuming plastic you're consuming uh, water you know water i mean drinking water is a huge contributor with the amount of water bottles that go in so what we have been trying to push as an agenda is zero plastic uh on uh, or zero single-use plastic across air, all trips that uh, people are working on. But, uh, a, you know, it's it's easier to do it at your own level. But the moment you have someone else, like let's say, Lara, you're running a tour company. And if I come to you, say that, why don't you invest uh, some extra money or from your profits to uh, create trips that are more sustainable? Uh, people don't want to do that right now because that awareness is still not there, right? Uh, but they are saying, I mean, the communities are not demanding these things. The communities are saying that we are not going to host travelers that are going to pollute our ecosystems because they have seen this, what you mentioned. The glacial streams are getting polluted to the fact that they had to stop expeditions on one of the mountains because uh, the entire glacial supply to the village that was downstream was just polluted and they ran out of drinking water. So they are seeing the impact of poor or uh, bad quality tourism sort of really creating a, a sort of significant impact on their day-to-day -day lives and th things are changing. Is it at a pace that I would want it to be? Absolutely no, but yes, I mean, you you know, you can always look at the glass. Thank you, yeah, that's great. I see that 
uh, Anshu, she's raising her hand. So if you want to, yeah, step in. Um, hi, hi, Jardeep. I absolutely have loved your work. And I was just wondering if there are plans to collaborate with other uh, organizations in the region and maybe move these programs to other countries in the hindu Himalaya regions? Yeah, great question. So we are already looking at uh, expanding it to Nepal uh, and then Madagascar, because uh, for us, it's not just mountain areas, but also remote areas. It could be, I was in Sumatra a couple of years back. So we have also identified villages in Sumatra where we can, problem with remote communities is similar, whether they are island communities or mountain communities. It's the problem of remoteness. It's a problem of lack of solutions and lack of skill. But the so the, but the sort of uh, solution that sort of expands across the entire spectrum are more or less the same. The communities are the same. Uh, the kind of, uh, you know, warmth and love that you get from these communities when you talk to them about these interventions is the same. So for us, it's looking at uh, geographies. Uh, Nepal is, of course, very close to us. And then Madagascar, we have found a lot of villages. So if any of you uh, has more knowledge on Madagascar and would like to help us with our expansion there, please feel free to reach out to us. Okay, anyone anyone else uh, has any question? I think I, I had another question, if you don't mind, okay. uh, very quickly. Uh, did you find any opposition from local communities to these initiatives or they always accept it as, as a good thing, let's say. So, uh, a great question. I uh, see one of the things is you cannot just parachute into a village with your solar panels and batteries and say, hey, we are going to electrify your village, right? We are your saviors. Uh, there's a process of mobilization. Uh, you first visit these communities, you understand their needs, you tell them the kind of solution that you want to bring in and also the development and sustainability model. Uh, because there has to be a buy-in from the community. So none of the villages that we have electrified or brought in intervention to has been a push from our side. It's a pull. Uh, a pull to the fact that every time we used to land in the local region, we used to have villagers outside the airport with uh, waiting with silk scarves, which they call Katak, uh, which they just put around us and said, hey, please electrify a village. You know, So uh, it's always a, been a pull and a great uh, strong pull. But as we speak right now, you know, I'm on my mobile, I'm getting messages. Uh, my team is surveying some villages to be rectified in the Northeast part of India. So anytime we get a request from the community, our team first goes, does the survey. Uh, we first understand the sort of uh, the logistics involved because electrifying a village is not easy, like I showed you, right? So what are the logistics? What are the challenges? What does the community need? Who are the young men and women in the village who would be willing to be trained as solar engineers? So we look at all that. Then and then only we sort of try to fundraise for those villages and electrify them. Otherwise, uh, you know, we, we give it a pass. So that way we have not seen any opposition till now. Okay, that's great. I see in the comments that everyone is, taking, is thanking you and saying that uh, it's a great initiative. So you have the support of all the participants, I think. It was uh, really great and uh, thank you for having me.